First of all, let me tell you all a little bit about our celebrity guest tonight. Y'all know who he is. But, you know, he he's pretty young. He's in his mid-20s, y'all. He's in his mid-20s, based out of Tampa. He previously worked for Grant Cardone and raised over $100 million of equity with Grant. <clears throat> and he did his first deal at the age of 24, 55 units, $8.2 million apartment complex in Daytona Beach, Florida. And since then, our celebrity guest has been absolutely crushing it in the game. He founded Bowling Companies, which is a consulting and education firm around real estate education. And he has personally been involved in helping operators raise over $10 million of equity, close 718 units, and structure their investor relations team to support scale. Now, our celebrity guest, his goal in creating content and brand on social media is to show and not tell. He's a man of action. So his goal <clears throat> is to get $1 billion with a B, $1 billion of assets under management by the age of 30. Beast, beast. So by being extremely open and transparent, he's going to show you the exact steps, people and decisions he's taking to do that $1 billion of AUM. So that way you guys can take the key pieces away and apply them to your own life. So without further ado, let me get my man pinned. Let me get my man pinned. And y'all, let's give an amazing Freedom Chasers welcome to our celebrity guest tonight, Mr. Gabe Bowling. DJ Come on, Gabe. Come on, brother. That's actually incredible. I'm pretty sure that like, that's the best job anybody's ever done. You make me feel. You make me. You make me feel a lot bigger than I actually am. And um, I don't. I just want to manage expectations. It makes it sound like I'm crazy, like ten years ahead of everybody. I'm not. So um, thank you for having me. I'm really excited uh, to be here. Gabe, I I got to do my best to do it justice, man. Everything thank we you. said is facts. It's the real deal. And, and just so everybody's aware, Gabe is a major supporter of the Freedom Chasers behind the scenes. You know, he's one of our preferred partners, and I can't thank him enough for all the support that he's given our core team behind the scenes. And yeah. I think it's really cool that we have Gabe with us as the celebrity guest on our last activation Zoom of 2023. So, Gabe, yeah. we got a lot to cover tonight, my man. Let's we do it. Let's jump cover. into it. And y'all know how we like to roll. Every celebrity guest that we bring on has a specific area of expertise, something that they're good at, but they each have a story. They have a personal side. And we always want to make sure we unpack something about their journey, right? Where they started and kind of how they ended up today and glean some of those nuggets because 99% of us all start from ground zero, ground zero. The same goes for Gabe. So Gabe, where, where yeah. should we start in your story that's, that's ground zero? Sure. Um, it starts probably at 18 to 19. I'll just give you like the the upbringing. My father's uh, Green Beret in the Special Forces. So I grew up in the military, move in kind of place to place. My uh, my home, I grew up in Tennessee. I lived there for like 12 years. And then I moved down to Florida my junior year of high school. Um, it, I say it starts at 18 because it's just go to school, get good grades and play sports. So I played baseball and football my entire life. Um, so, you know, it was fun. I didn't really, I didn't have to work, but I also wasn't like, I didn't have any money. Like I just had to ask my mom and dad for like, Hey, can you get me some gas? Or can you give me like, I'm going on a date. Can I get your credit card? That was always, <laughs> that was kind of embarrassing, but that's like the upbringing. That's the childhood that I had. My mom is an incredible stay at home mom. She's my best friend. I probably talked to her once a day. So, um, that's kind of the upbringing. Uh, I say it starts at 18 because that's the ending of high school. And that's kind of where you kind of uh, have to grow up and like face okay. life and actually make right. money and stuff. Um, I wasn't good enough to go and play college. Like I, I had a hand me a handout from a JUCO college up the street that I just I went up there and practiced for. So they're like, all right, well, you can walk on if you want. And so that was a really big ego check because I thought I was good. <laughs> and uh, I did. I decided not to go and play baseball. I decided it's like, all right, well, let's. Like, it's time to grow up. Let's figure out what's like what life is about for me. So I, I kind of went through a period of like I was lost because I, I didn't have baseball. That's all that I knew for like the last 18 years. Um, I found bodybuilding. So I transitioned from uh, high school playing baseball into bodybuilding. And that was my first year of uh, 
real freedom, I call it, in college when I wasn't living with my parents. And I was I was definitely lost, uh, almost failed out my first uh, half semester and ended up moving back in with my parents, smoked a lot of weed, that's for sure, back in uh, high school and college. Um, I ended up finding bodybuilding. I ended up getting a lot of discipline out of it. I competed twice. I got shredded. I actually just hired a, a professional bodybuilding coach like recently, like three weeks ago. Um, so it's crazy how full cycle it went. But I ended up finding my wife. That's really where life starts to to hit different, like go really different for me. Because at that point, I'm just lost. Um, now wife, then girlfriend. She came up on the lower end of the middle class. So she's been, you know, Panera Bread at 4.30 in the morning, making $8 an hour. So it was like the lower end of the middle class. And so it's like, the closer that we got, the I, I say the, the deeper in love that I became, I realized that I had to make a decision. It was either, hey, make some changes in your life. You, like, you got to grow up and make some money um, or you're going to lose her. And so I, I made the hard decision. I gave up comfort and uh, I got my real estate license. That's really where it began at 19, I think. I'd have to fact check it. I think I was 19 when I got my real estate license. Uh, failed the test three times, passed it on my fourth time. Money didn't start hitting the bank account. I didn't know, like, I just thought you get license and that's it. It just, it didn't happen. So I ended up calling a lot of brokerages. Like I didn't go on the Indeed and just apply. I just figured like pick up the phone and cold call all these people and just say, my pitch was, um, hey, my name's Gabe. I'm 19 or 20 and I don't know anything about real estate, but I can work for free because I was living with my mom and dad at the time. Um, and I knew that was the only way that I was going to be hired. Like I had no real value. I didn't provide much of a skill. I didn't solve many problems for brokers or even realtors. Why, why bring me on? Well, will you hire somebody for free that will take care of the annoying work that you don't want to do? Mm -hmm. Perfect. And so I ended up landing a job with Marcus and Millichap. That was my big, that was like a moment. That was my first big win, getting the license and then landing the job at Marcus and Millichap. For everybody that doesn't know, you should know if you're on this call and you're jumping in the multifamily, you should know who Marcus Millichap is. That's um, right. they're, a, they're a national multi or a national commercial real estate firm between one to $20 million is their specialization. Um, I worked there for free for about 10 or 11 months, just doing the monotonous, like underwriting, calling owners and calling. Uh, I worked for uh, marinas and golf courses at the beginning. And then I slowly transitioned into apartments. So it was really fun. Nice. But I yeah. learned like, I learned what cap rate was. I learned what NOI was. I learned like how a transaction actually works from the, the sell side and the buy side being in the brokerage. Um, so it was really cool. But like these little OMs, this is the deal that we bought. I would bind these OMs. Like I would take all the paper and then I would be like, <laughs> where's the binder? How do you bind something? I was like, like I, was, I was that guy. So Real grunt work. Real yeah, grunt it's work. not the fun, but yeah, I was let around me, people. Let yeah, me jump in here really quick because I think there's two things that I think at least stick out to me that sure. is good to realize that contribute to your sex success. Number one is that now your significant other, your girlfriend at the time, who is in the audience? No pressure, Gabe. No pressure. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it, you had somebody in your life that put you in a place where you had to make a decision. Yeah. You had to make a decision. So I think that that's one learning lesson is that, hey, we need to have people in our life that can give us a reality check. Yeah. So that's the first thing that I recognize. And the second one was working for free, working for free to gain knowledge and expertise. So I feel like I've been, I've put many hours <laughs> working for free, right? To, to learn yeah. this business and understand and, and still learning, right? But I know that that's a, a big principle that I hear quite frequently. People with success is they were willing to work for free to gain the necessary skills to be successful in the space. So I just wanted to highlight those two things that are kind of sticking out to me right now. But back to you, brother. Um, well, thank you for pointing those things out. I think it's important. I can say, you know, I can say a bunch and I can focus on different areas of where things started to change, but I'm guys, I'm here for every single, like, I don't like to show up just, you know, I don't do a lot of speaking, like a lot of these things. And I'm really, I am a really big believer of, um, what you guys are doing here. That's why I'm here. I want to bring and provide as much value as I possibly can. So anywhere throughout this, it's been six years now since we got started anywhere off, uh, throughout the entire journey. Just stop me and ask. I'm completely an open book. Um, sometimes right. it's too too much of an open book. But um, yeah, okay. let me let me insert. A, sorry. Yeah. Uh, one more comment right here. Guys, we're changing things up a little bit. OK, tonight with our format. If you've been with us before, 
we usually reserve the last 10 or 15 minutes for Q&A. This time with Gabe, we're essentially weaving in Q&A the entire time, the entire time. So you can drop it in the chat. I, I may or may not catch it, but if you if you can think of a question, raise your hand and we'll ask you to unmute and you can fire your question away right then and there. So we're not gonna wait till the end for Q&A. Q&A is we throughout this whole thing, all right? So keep that in mind, a little change up on our previous uh, activations in format. Okay, Thank Gabe. You. Thank That's you my for last that. interruption for the next five minutes. It's all, all good. Um, I'm about to answer the question that just popped up, the transition from uh, Marcus to Grant. So okay, at the cool. time, I at that time, I actually didn't follow Grant because he was annoying. I was one of those guys who like, I was like, a, I was such a hater internally because I wanted that type of life. I was like, man, this can't be real. He's so annoying. Doesn't work. It's so funny how things like go full cycle because now I'm that guy that bangs your email every day, twice a day. Um <laughs> I I got a I got a notification from my wife um, on Instagram saying that Cardone Capital was hiring. I think that this was her way of saying like, "Hey, I really appreciate that you grew up and you got your license that you're driving to Marcus uh, every day at six in the morning, uh, but you're still not closing deals and you're not making any money, and we're still living with your parents." So, like, wink, wink. Um, maybe you should look at this. Uh, she's on this call too, just FYI. Um, so I take a look at it and I'm like, all right, well, I'm 10 months in. And the way that Marcus works is you, you develop a database of all these owners for six to 12 months. And then on the back end of it, you hit the phones. So I was on the back end of it. I was about to hit the phones. And then this opportunity popped up and I was like, well, let's see if we can even get it. So we went down to Miami. I think it was really good, good, uh, good timing. I call it luck. And just enough experience. Like if I didn't make the decision to work for free for Marcus and Millichap, I wouldn't have been hired. I would have just been another person that was an Instagram fan on social media that wants to be in real estate. Um, I went down to Miami. I met with Andres, Ryan, and then Grant. I went through Andres, uh, interviewed with Ryan, and then met Grant, and then they hired me on the same the same day. Um, that was November. I think it was November 4th of 2019 is when I started at Grant's office. I started at fund three. Um, there was three other guys. It was me at the age of 21 and another 21 year old, a 24 year old and a 26 year old um, and one, one 28 year old. Bunch of young guys, hungry, willing to work 12 to 14 hours a day. We were on the phones at least 100 to 150 calls every single day. Um, that's really where like the first win was getting the license. The second win was getting landing the job with Marcus and Millichap, developing skill and real value to the company or to somebody that can solve their problems. And then I landed that that right there, landing the job at Grant's office was like a ginormous, ginormous uh, momentum building, I guess, when you could call it. Um I knew that I got in early enough where I would role play with Grant, at least for the first year, the first six months, at least. Um, it was me, Grant, Ryan, Andres, Pat, and Ryan, one other Ryan. Um, we would role play every single day because we were the most important vein of the company because when you're raising money from investors, um, management of expectations is extremely important. When they're making 100000 or 250000 or you know, when you get up and you become really good there, you only talk to really wealthy people. And so when I left, I was only talking to people who like, if you weren't investing a hundred grand, I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to hundred, 250, 500, a million, 5 million, 10 million. The management of expectations really, 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 really matter. And so we were really close to Grant and it was life-changing opportunity. It was an incredible time. So I worked there for three years. I went through 19 transactions. It was about $3 billion of deals total. Um, I raised about $100 million total uh, from retail investors over a three-year period. And then I really got the deal bug. That's We'll kind of talk about why I quit and how I quit and the decision-making behind why I quit, giving up a lot of money. Um, I got the deal bug. I got obsessed with the business that we were actually in versus being the investor relations person on the phone, making a couple hundred grand a year. And so I was like, what... What really are we doing? We're in the private equity real estate business, to be completely honest with you. And it's a very large game. We're playing with very small crumbs. If you've ever seen the, the movie War, it's probably not the best uh, movie to reference, but War Dogs, um, there's a ginormous pie 
and you're playing with the crumbs, we are playing with the crumbs. They're just six, seven, eight, and nine figure crumbs. Like the real <laughs> pie is much bigger than we actually think. So that's, that's how I got into grants. Um, you know, we can speak a lot about it. I probably I can't you know, I can't really go into too much detail about it, but I'm more than more than open to taking a couple of questions about my time there. I got my MBA in marketing, money, business, real estate. Um a lot. I mean, talking to investors, 10,000 phone calls and really only talking to accredited investors. It just you develop a, a skill set. That was probably the number one thing that I took away from there, developing the skill set of being able to communicate. Gabe, I got a question I want to fire away. And then Anthony threw a question here as, uh, as well. So let's start with Anthony's, then we can jump over to mine. Yeah. So Anthony asked, were you cold calling for? Oh, my goodness. No, I've, I've never made a cold call in my life and I will never make a cold call in my life ever, 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 ever. It's called social media, social media and warm inbound leads. I mean, that guy, I mean, Grant has 15, he was the, he's the pioneer of syndicating money from online retail investors. He is the yeah. pioneer. He's the only one who really, who really is doing it at scale. Um, he's raised over a billion dollars online. And I started when it was 125 or 130, 130 million bucks. It's all social media. Wow. Hey, what's going on here? Watch this. Hey, what's going on? It's Gabe. I got a new deal. Um, if you're accredited and you're interested in investing, click the link, shoot me a text, and we'll jump on a call. That's warm. You know me. That's so right. I'm not calling, I'm not cold calling anybody. Everybody knows who Grant is. Now, the the quality, uh, you know, the quality of the person definitely matters. Um, but everybody for the most part knows who Grant is. Yeah. And, and I guess Anthony, he he said for PML, so I guess private mm -hmm. money lenders or PMPs. I don't know what a PMP is. I don't know what a PMP. My mind doesn't go to uh, accredited investors whenever I see PMP. <laughs> That's right, man. That's right. So my question is this, Gabe, success leaves clues and there's always underlying principles of success, right? None of us here, I don't think so. PMP, private money partner. Yeah. I don't think anybody here has a billion dollar uh, brand. If you do, let us know in the chat. Like we yeah, want to one hundred percent. Nobody does here. No, me either. So, so, but the thing is, is that what, what are like two or three underlying principles mm -hmm. that allowed you to raise a hundred million, to raise mm -hmm. grants, to have grants team raise a billion dollars in mm -hmm. in whatever short amount of time from social media that yeah. we can apply if we're new to the capital raising space. Yeah. Well, you know, I did that there. And then, so when I left Grant's office, I did one-on-one -on -one consulting with high net worth guys and just people who own a lot of real estate. And we did uh, really well. And we raised probably 35 or 40 million bucks um, from retail or retail investors from their audiences. Um, it's building trust. It doesn't matter how big, like, I mean, if you really think about it, especially on the, in the beginning of your career, you're going to be doing probably one to three, maybe $4 million transactions for the first couple of deals. At least I, I think you should be. Um, it's only going to require a million dollars of equity for the most part. That's 10 people at a hundred grand, not 15 million people at a hundred grand or 15,000 people at a hundred grand. You have to find 10 people that will say yes for a hundred grand. And so how do you build trust with 10 people that will say yes to you, that know you enough and like you to, to really trust you to give you 100 grand for a project that you think is good? So um, the number one reason why people don't invest with you, regardless, I, I'm raising, just so you guys know, I'm raising money for a deal right this second out in Missouri. And then we just got awarded another deal here in Florida um, that we're going to be raising a lot of capital for. Uh, the number one reason, like the deal's a freaking screamer, like home run. If they don't know me and trust me, they're not going to invest with me. Like on the paper, it can say ridiculous returns. If we've never done business with like ever, and we're starting the conversation today, and I'm asking you for a hundred grand today, it's going to be really tough to get you to invest. But if I know you and I've been calling you for six months, even if it's friends and family, or if it's the close, like the circle of influence that your colleagues at work um, or like Friday nights, if you're ever going out to dinner, like meet new people, you don't, you only need a hundred people in your pipeline to raise a million dollars. So that's the number one thing that you have to do number like trust and then know your stuff too. I see a lot of investors trying to raise money that don't know what they're getting into, like the business that they're trying to raise money for. They don't know how to answer some of the questions that an investor, like an investor will test you. And you have to be prepared to be able to answer the questions with certainty.
Because if if I'm if I'm going to invest, I'm an investor. We're trying to invest money before the end of the year. I'm having a lot of conversations, and I'm telling you for like real time. If I ask you a question and I can tell that you're not confident about it, and you lie, like if you're lying about it, I'm not investing with you at all. Because I know that you know that you don't know what you're doing. And then if you don't know what you're doing, at least have somebody that you can go to and get the right answer and be open and honest about it. So knowing your stuff and then building trust. Outstanding. Outstanding. Gabe, I think Irene has, I don't think, I know, Irene has a really great question in the chat. Yeah. And I think that's probably a good segue into yeah. your post Grant Cardone life. And yeah. What it looked like. Oh my goodness. It was the hardest raise I ever raised. I only raised a million dollars for my first deal. Uh, we pitched it to probably 100, maybe 120 people, and 12 of them said yes. I went through a lot of no's. All of it was just people that I built over the last three years. I mean, I had like a couple, like I had maybe 2,000 followers on my on my total like reach of people that just, you know, they knew that I worked for Grant. They followed me. It wasn't like a lot. Um, and we raised, it was 987 something thousand dollars that was total that hit the bank. Um, it's really hard and you have to have somebody that you can leverage partners. I partnered with Ken Gee. If you guys are in the industry, you probably know who Ken is. He's been on this call. Um, I'm partnering with him on another deal. Um, I leveraged my, my experience with Grant was really like, it's imagine you bank at Chase and then you have a really good relationship with your Chase teller that you go and deposit check, uh, checks with. And you're like, okay, he's somewhat smart. He works at Chase and he has a responsibility, all this stuff. And then he leaves and he calls you and says, hey, I have a really good deal. You don't, just because he worked at Chase doesn't mean he's automatically a really good sponsor and a really good allocator of capital. And so it's like, you still, like, cool, you have Grant's experience, but like, show me the deal. And then why should I still give you money? You've never done anything before. So it helped, but it definitely wasn't like if I didn't have Ken, I wouldn't have been able to raise very, 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 very like any money. Um, I don't believe. So mm -hmm. that's a really good question. And since then, all I've been doing is showing like the best way that you can build trust is show. Hey, guys, I'm looking at deals every single week. I mean, I have a big community. We do a lot of stuff on deals. We have a lot of people that are just going out to their immediate circle of influence and just posting, like for instance, on Facebook, I saw one of our community members do this, uh, posted on Facebook, probably got 13 likes, not a lot of people, 13 likes, two comments. One of the two comments was a chiropractor. Hey, wow, I didn't know you were doing this. Please reach out to me the next time you have a deal. All the post was, was just a picture. It didn't even have the name of the property. It was just a picture of an apartment complex and said, Wow. Hey, I, I just wanted to let my immediate you know, network of friends and family know that I'm jumping into the apartment space all the way in. And um, I want to show you and bring you along the way. So that way, hey, like six months down the road, you finally get that deal. They, hey, now you have six months of planting seeds with people and developing trust. That's why I love social media. It's like I get to send an email, but it's like they see my face every single day, mm -hmm. probably two or three times a day. The goal of my marketing is whenever you have 100 or 250 grand in your bank and you're like, you pull up your account and you're like, I need to invest it. I need to get rid of this money. Somebody becomes the first train of thought in that person's head. I want to be that, that little train of thought. That's my goal over the next 10, the 15, the 20 years. That's excellent. That's excellent. We, we got a question here in the chat from Michael. What was the ratio for yes to no when you first started? Whatever 12 divided by 120 is, so like 7%. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And that was, it's it's a lot. But I also didn't have enough time. So I'll keep going on the story because this is where it gets kind of fun. All right. Is I, so up to 2022, so you get bonuses at the end of the year, just in private equity finance, end of year bonus always happens. And you know it's coming. And so at the end of year uh, three, um, my wife and I, we're always, we're very big believe, like we're all the way into this together. We go, we do everything together. We're all the way into creating an, an amazing life and doing a lot and impacting a ton of people. Um, so we're always assessing, Hey, what did we set out to do? Like, this is what we wanted to do in 2022. We're at the end of 2022. This is what we did. Are we happy? Yes. Perfect. What do you want to do for 2023? And moving forward, like, what is your, what's the, what are you working towards? 
And so at the beginning of the year, we like, we knew, Hey, you know, 12 to 14 hours a day, quality of life. That was one of the biggest reasons we left. I just, we knew that we were going to do something big. It was just how long were we going to be there for? Um, we wanted to, we wanted to take that leap. Um, this is how I made the decision to leave. And it took probably 20 hours of just walking around endless laps of walks with our dogs. And then just my wife and I talk going back and forth. What's the worst case? Like what happens if we do it? What happens if we don't do it? What, what, like, what, what if, what if, what if? Um, worst case scenario, I have three years of track record, raised a hundred million dollars, worked for Grant, and it looks really good on paper. That's the worst case scenario. And I can find somebody to hire me and make the same 250 to 300 grand that I was making. So that was cool. I had to give up 250 a year for everybody that's like curious. It's really tough to walk away from 250 a year at 24 years old. And I call it the golden parachute. Somebody referred to golden handcuffs. It's very, 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 very real. Golden parachute, when you're in early enough that you're going to be taken care of, you're moving up, you're a leader, you're taking on more responsibility. Um, but you're not in early enough to be ownership. So it's it's those people who get taken care of very well. I was in that position. And so we had to give that up. And we were like, well, what's best case scenario? Um, we are living the best case scenario, just so you know. Like we didn't oh. plan for this to be anywhere a part of our plan two years later. Um, we were like, well, let's just do it. And so we did it. But before we did it, uh, we left February 1st. That was my last day. I quit February 1st. Before we did that, uh, my wife and I, we were engaged at the time and we were like, well, let's just go all the way in and let's really do this thing. If we're going to go, if we're going to pass like this, this stamp, um, it was kind of us like entering a new phase of our life. Um, so we went down the Key West and we eloped. It was just me and her best decision we made. Uh, not a lot of stress. We got married on January 9th. Uh, and then I came back and then we quit on February 1st. And then this deal I keep showing it. This is Daytona Palms. I get the email. It's from here. I get the email on February 4th of 2022, um, four days after I quit. And it comes from Ned Roberts, who is the same person that I worked for at the same Marcus Millichap that I worked for free for like wow. four years ago. Wow. Um, and then we went under contract and we bought it. And then we closed. We, so we closed that deal on June 24th of 2022. I partnered with Ken. Uh, Ken's fund invested $3 million. I raised a million bucks. And that thing is performing extremely well. Um, we're paying 6.5% to the investors. We bought it with a fixed loan for five years at 387 interest only, full term. Um, we got 400 bucks on our, our upside. Wow. And we're doing very well. Um what else? I think that's really it for the deal. That's my transitioning from quitting grants and then doing the deal. Um, in that period of time, I did the consulting. So one-on-one, -on -one, I charged, just so you guys know, I charged 25 grand. Uh, I was insane. I, don't, I can't, I can't justify charging anything close to 25 grand any, like really ever again. Um, but I did that. That was interesting. We had 13 clients. We closed 700 units and then raised about 25 or 30 million bucks um, from retail investors. Killer, bro. Killer. So, so what's going on with, with you now, Gabe? I mean, you mentioned a couple of deals, a, a deal that you're on right now, yeah. a deal that, you know, you got locked in pretty recently. What's, yeah. what's bowling capital going on, man? What's like the bowling's, like, what magic are you guys making right now? And what's, what's on your short-term horizon as well? Yeah. Well, I guess to better answer that, we should probably walk through the last 12 months, um, okay. which is where the inception of the deal room started. So we started a community. I was really sick of just working as a dog. I mean, as a consultant, that's really all you do. You just, you you fire yourself from a W-2 to become another, you know, just self-employed W-2. Um, yeah, that's right. So we started, so we started the deal room community. Uh, our, our intention there was we had a lot of sponsors that wanted to partner with me and um, I didn't have enough deal flow. So I was like, all right, well, let's just open up a small community and let's actually train them. Um, and actually like take the time, walk through the underwriting, like detailed underwriting. I don't really do coming from Grant's office. All I knew was surface level, high level back of napkin stuff. I really love it, um, as like an entry point, but you need to jump, like you need to jump into the details. That's where the devil lives on a lot of these deals. Yeah. Um, and so we started that a year ago, we scaled it to 180 people across the country. We're probably, I think as of right this second, 518, I think is the live number, uh, 518 units under contract collectively as a community. 
50 oh. million awarded. It's now close to 75. I'll tell you about it. Um, close to 75 awarded. And I think we've that's 92 offers that the deal room collectively has submitted from 180 members. So that's what we've been doing for the last 12 months. Uh, it's helped tremendously on the bowling capital side of things because we get to look at ridiculous amounts of deals, um, which is kind of brings me up to where I'm at today uh, or where my wife and I are at today. Um, right this second, we are raising a million dollars for a portfolio actually in Sedalia, Missouri, if anybody knows where that is. Um, Missouri that came from a very experienced operator out of the deal room. His name's Brian Dawson. Um, he's flipped about 1900 homes, owns a portfolio of 40 million bucks. Um, really, 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 really down the earth, really good person. And he brought the deal to the deal room. He pitched it. He raised half a million dollars. And then he said, Hey man, I need another million. Do you want a partner? And so I vetted it out. I flew out there, met him, saw the deal. It's really good. Ridiculous returns. Um, that's current. That's literally in the last 10 days, we raised a million dollars. We had $850,000 in commitments in the first seven days and less wow. than 15 phone calls. I posted one time, um, all, every current investor that's in our Daytona deal is there in it. I could have, e I could have refilled all of it from current investors, but I wanted to establish, um, two to three new relationships with new investors. And then, Literally, as of Friday, nobody knows this. So please, everybody here, sign your Air NDA, just so I can see it. Sign an Air NDA. Okay, so <laughs> we just got awarded the deal. I, that's all I can say. I'm not going to say too much. We got awarded another deal that I've been trying to buy for the last five months. Um, emotionally draining, very, very, very back and forth. Not very fun to be in the, sh the, the seat uh, for five months getting pulled back and forth. But uh, we finally got it. So we're moving into a PSA. Um, all in all, that should bring us up. If on wood, we got to close, uh, should bring us up to about 40 to 45 million bucks of AUM, uh, whenever we close. So we close the Missouri deal in uh, 10 days on the 18th, whenever that is. And then the new deal won't close until like February of next year. We, I mean, we stole it. Just wait until we have a PSA. Once we have a signed PSA, you won't not be able to see it. You will see it everywhere you look, your email, Instagram, YouTube, <laughs> you will see it everywhere. That's right. And, and y'all, Ed is, is helping pump the chat up with, with all of Gabe's links. So y'all make sure y'all get plugged in with him and all the amazing stuff that he has going on. Uh, I want to ask a question to the audience. And Gabe, maybe you can field some of these questions. Um, yeah, please. I want to ask you guys, okay? And regardless of whether you feel like you fit into the capital raising space in the multifamily, okay, so you have the multifamily space here, the big umbrella, and there's different areas that you could fit in to add value. Capital raise is one of them. In my personal opinion, Gabe, I think mm -hmm. everybody needs to know at a fundamental level how to raise capital. I agree. Regardless of whether you think, oh, I need to be in asset management or, you know, I just want to underwrite deals. Everybody on a fundamental level needs to know how to raise capital. I agree. So I want to pose a question to everybody here tonight. What obstacles do you foresee going into 2024 that would prevent you from raising a million dollars? It's a really good question. What obstacles, both externally, but probably even more so internally here and here, are the obstacles that you foresee that would prevent you from raising $1 million in 2024? Drop those in the chat. Or fire a question related to that question in the chat or raise your hand. You can ask Gabe directly. Okay. No, no, no. And uh, I think that would be, I think that would add value to the audience. Do you believe, you believe that Gabe? I believe it would. Okay. Awesome. All right, we I got believe it. I mean, what, what would happen? What would happen if you just, I don't know, had unlimited money and could like buy unlimited deals with unlimited money coming from unlimited investors? Now I don't like, I hate, I hate managing expect. I hate the, I absolutely hate managing expectations to the degree in which people look at like they're using investors money. You are not using investors monies. You are investing their money. You don't use them so you can make money. You do a good job by taking care of their money. And as a bonus, you get paid in the process. So I see a lot of I see a lot of people online that say, 
I bought this deal. I, I got a loan from the bank or I did seller finance or I did sub two. And then I, I used this investor's money. And so I get to make this money because I use their money. You see how that word just sound like that wordage? It sounds a little yeah. bit selfish. Um, hey, in my job, as a, this is from uh, Barry Sternlich. He's the largest apartment owner there is. Look him up, start with capital. I've countless hours of YouTube. Like this, this is where I get a lot of my data. Um, our jobs, if you're jumping into raising capital, our jobs is to allocate capital to the best returns with the least amount of risk, period. Our jobs is to allocate capital to the best returns with the least amount of risk. Yep. And in the process, you get paid very handsomely. It's an extremely, like from a value, a max value skill set, being able to raise capital is one of the most, uh, I guess you could, I look at it as a sport almost. I, I really do look at this thing as an entire sport because I've played sports my entire life. This is the sport that you can play the longest and get paid the most. I mean, if, if you're not convinced after that, I don't know what's going to do it. We got some really good stuff in the chat here, Gabe. Yeah. Um, and and thank you, everyone, for sharing that because obviously it's it can be difficult to share your challenge in, in obstacles in a public forum like this. So yeah. Alicia has some good stuff. But dude, I, I'd say let's just run through the list which, with what you yeah. got there, Gabe. Not knowing the correct people and having the skill level that would make me attractive. Well, fortunately, I'm okay. I don't want to make that joke. Uh, I would make it with the deal room people, but I don't know everybody as well as I know you guys. Um, having people that have done it before, and so being in groups like this, leveraging people that have done it before is what it's probably the only way that you're going to cheat, use it as a cheat code and not get bashed in the face over and over and over and over um, at the front end by leveraging somebody that's already done it before. And so, like, for instance, us, we, I don't know what deal, like, here, this is a better question. What size deals is everybody looking at in here? Are they looking at larger deals? Are they trying to, are they trying to uh, raise money and invest in other people's deals? Or whenever you guys think about raising money, what comes to your mind? Is it you found a deal and you're raising money for that deal? Or is it you found an operator and you're trying to invest in that operator's deal? Or what's the general uh, thesis here, Trevor? Yeah. I would say it's it's going to be a mixed bag. It's going to be y'all yeah. drop it in the chat. All right. Are you yeah. trying to? The re, the, okay. So the reason I asked that question is because, um, like for instance, in our our deal room, we take people down a pathway in which their first deal is typically sixteen to thirty two units. These transactions are typically one to three, maybe four million dollars of of volume. And these, like for instance, a two million dollar deal. It's under contract right this second in PA. It's twenty six units, uh, two million dollars. There's a seller carry, it's $1.8 million carry and the equity, all in equity needed for the deal is 250 grand. That is one check. He found it from our community. His name is David. He's putting the entire thing. He sold his company. He's an investor. He's from the area. He knows the deal, wants to invest in the area. Morgan found it, David's partnering in, and that's the deal. It's an easy, It's I don't want to say it's easy, but the probability of being able to pull that off and get into a deal and see it actually done, which really gives you a lot of confidence, which is pretty much the number one thing you need whenever you are raising money. If you don't have confidence, it's really going to be hard to raise money. Where do you get confidence? From people that have done it before, because you see them doing it and you see that you see it working. You're like, oh, wow, he just did it in front of my face. It worked. He made money. The investors made money. Wow, why can't I do this? And so seeing other people do it kind of make you believe it, but then you doing it yourself, it really gives you a lot of confidence. It's like there's a book or there needs to be a book on the magic of the first deal. When I raised the million bucks for it, I had a lot of uncertainty in my head. You can ask my wife. It was a lot like if I had this whoop when I raised the money, I don't know what my stats would have looked like. It would have been terrible for the level <laughs> of sleep uh, that I had. On the back end of it, like the conversations that I'm having with investors now, night and day difference because of the confidence. The confidence. So hopefully that answers. I just talked a lot, but let's keep yeah. going. Yeah, I think that was good. I mean, you hit on a lot of things, right? Like not knowing the correct people. Yeah. You got to get plugged into communities where people are actually doing. Yeah, you can do single things. family alone, guys. You can do single family alone because that's all it takes. It's just a W-2. You use your income. You, you're underwrite or you get underwritten. 
and you have, uh, you know, you have so much money and you have so much, you know, you can buy so many deals. Doing it alone is completely fine. There's no right or wrong way of building wealth um, within real estate. If you're going to jump in the multifamily, which I highly recommend, like you'll make a lot more money and it's much more fun and you become uh, an investor and not a landlord, um, you're going to need people. Like 1000%, you're going to need people. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I mean, experience, credibility, you talked about that. I mean, you know, a lack of confidence. Confidence comes from from knowing what you're talking about and then having yeah. a great support system. Yeah, yeah. Just so you know, like a perfect, there's a guy in my group, his name's Scott Nowback. He's from Ohio. He's a really big, he's built. So his first deal was a four unit and then he bought an eight unit in Ohio for very, very, very cheap. He sold both of those 1031 into a 27 unit deal, very heavy value added uh, deal. He did that. He did the work on it, sold that in 1031 from a 27 into a 120 unit deal, um, all in a six year period. It took him three years to buy the first 27. And then it took him another three years to go from 27 to 120. Um, he just his first deal or one of his first deals um, he was telling me about it was an eight unit deal that all in he was in for 45 grand. He sold it a year later, walked away with two hundred ninety two thousand dollars. Nobody is going to like praise you on Instagram for buying an eight unit deal. Like it doesn't look really sexy. Nobody, nobody yeah. tell like I say this. Um, I, I don't know. A, a lot of people need to hear this, but people need to stop chasing the title, the title of being the GP, like being like, oh, I own a thousand units. I'm a GP. I'm really, 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 really cool. I'm in the private equity space and focus on the skill set that it actually takes to retain the title. Like if you focus on building the skill set, of being a good operator and understanding the business or even for the capital raising side of it, understanding what a good deal is or understanding what a good operator looks like. So you can make sound decisions where you're investing money into. Um, like it, I'm, I'm telling you people, it doesn't matter where you're at in your career. You can be in year one or you can be in year five. Like for us, we're in year six. We're trying to focus on 20 to $30 million transactions right now. Don't do what I'm doing. Focus on where people are at within the first year, one to two years and then get to year two and then focus on going from year two to year four and then from year four to year six. That's so right. hopefully that helps. Right. Yeah, that's really good. I want to make sure we hit Kim's um, challenges that she foresees. She's, yes. she's mentioned here living abroad and networking, but raising money for properties in the U.S. Could you speak to that, Gabe? Yeah, well, it, well, how... Is Kim able to come up here and uh, elaborate on the question maybe a little bit? Location, so she's out of the country, she's networking, and she's raising money for properties in the U.S. Well, I would ask a question for your investor database. Are you, at, are you making sure, to do that, I would make sure the people that you're trying to raise money from have already invested in the U.S. because the legal and the taxation hoop or loops that you have to jump through to set up an entity to not get double taxed, uh, to pay a little bit less in tech, uh, taxes, it's a lot. And so I see a very, 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 very large drop off between the people that are interested in investing in the U.S. that are living abroad and then the people that have, are living abroad that have invested in the U.S., that gap between the people who are interested and who have actually done it, there's a very large fall off. I would target, especially at the beginning, I would target people that have already invested in the U.S. Um, and ask them, what are they investing in? Um, there's definitely a CPA and an attorney that needs to be in that. And I would maybe set up a fund, maybe market. Like you could look at your marketing. You can market uh, yourself as the person that's going and investing into multifamily in the U.S. Um, if you're interested, reach out. Um Hopefully that helps. It's pretty hard to do it, to be honest with you. Thanks, bro. Thanks. Yeah. Gabe, I think now's currently. a good time. What's that? I was reading the comment. 20 unit. That's a great size. I love that. Perfect size. That's one to two JV partners away. It was a really good deal. Talk about partners, Gabe. And yeah. and what, you know, some of the things that the process that it takes and the things that we need to be on look out for when it comes to partnerships in the multifamily space. Yeah. Ask the hard questions and be okay with it. Like, and what are some of those hard questions? 
When's the last time you got into a partnership that went bad and why? And what are you looking to do, not on this deal, but what are you looking to do over the next 20 to 30 years? And why should we partner? And why do we align? I don't do many partnerships. I get a, I get people asking me for a lot of money because we can raise. I I say right now that we can raise between five and $10 million for a deal, just the way that we built out our funnel, the way that we have, like we have 1400 accredited leads in our database that we haven't emailed at all. Like I've never like no calls or anything. Um, I don't partner with a lot of people by design because I've been, I've kind of been quiet in the background. I'm just, we're not big enough yet. Um, it's allowed me to look and and observe very closely. And Trevor, I know you've seen this being in the, in the industry, the, like we've been doing it, I don't know, two or three years or two years. And then I was at Grant's office for three years. And so being in the environment, you see a lot of people get together. Hey, I want to do deals. I want to do partnership. And then it happens and then it goes bad. And you're like, well, why'd that happen? A lot of the times you can avoid uh, getting into a bad relationship by managing the expectations on the front end of what this relationship is going to look like from roles, responsibilities, and asking hard questions. Hey, what happens if the deal goes south and we need 50 grand each? Are you going to have it? What if we need to put 50 grand into a deal? Worst case scenario, are you going to have cash on hand? Uh, what happens if, uh, what, what happens if a third partner in the partnership goes south and, um, uh, he doesn't want to be involved anymore. Are you willing to work together with me to keep the partnership alive to buy him out? Um, do you have any pending lawsuits? Do you have any uh, defaults recently? Do you are you for are you getting foreclosed on? I just had I've I won't say names, but we've been reached out to by people that are raising money for a deal that they bought two years ago, and they were, they're pitching it as like, hey, we're just, you know, it's such a good deal. We're letting people in. It's like, God, no, you're not. You're just raising money so we can try to save you. And it's like, wow, it's just, it's, um, you know, you just, yeah, I could probably sit here and on and on, but I don't want to talk about negativity. Um, the biggest thing that I've learned to do very well with people that I'm partnering with is do we align over a 20 year to a 30 year period? What are you looking to do? Bryant, Bryant Dawson. Um, he's really well off, really well off. He doesn't need money. He doesn't need it. And the deal that we're raising money on, it's a 5X return over a seven-year uh, seven period with a refi in year three. Ridiculous cash flow. Wow. And if we, just, if we did a 50-50 split, we could still hit a 3X return to the investors net over the same seven-year period. We're cool giving an 80-20 through and through because we want to take care of the investors on the front end and hit an absolute grand slam so that they invest with us year after year after year after year after year. And so him not being the greedy person and saying, man, there's so much juice on this deal. Um, let's do a 50-50 because why not? The investors are going to be happy. That was like, that was really, really, really one of the biggest reasons why I partnered with him. Because I know that we align is some of the, it was the almost identical thought process that I had for my first deal. I was like, I could probably get away with charging a lot more of an acquisition fee. Nobody really knows what it is. And I could, you know, I could put more money into my pocket. It's like, I don't need it. Like, let's just take care of the investors. This is the net, like, this is a 20 to 30 year invest, uh, 20 to 30 year plan for us. That's right. That's right. Gabe, could you break down a little bit of the different types of partnerships in the multifamily space, like a GP partnership? Maybe yeah. like, um, you kind of just raise for like a, maybe a fund to funds. Yeah. So you have a, you have a joint venture, which is 16. I mean, anything really less than uh 2 million bucks, you should probably just do in a JV with one to two different people. Um, that's like the wild, wild West way of doing it. Um, if you don't want to go through the, the SEC and um, raise money and sell securities, but if you're going to do like a fund, the fund, you can do a fund, the fund, uh, which is you're opening up a fund. You have a big network of people or you, you, are developing it. You get capital commitments. Um, like for instance, here, I'm, ra I'm raising money for an opportunity fund. I'm going to find great deals. If you guys want to invest in it, just click the link, you know, invest. And then that's a capital commitment. And then I can go out and find different operators. Let's say Trevor had a deal that he was raising money for. I, as a fund to fund, could invest that capital into Trevor's deal um, and then into Gabe's deal and then into Richard's deal and then into uh, Ed's deal. Um, that's what a fun to fun is. Not many people 
uh, do it until you have at least a decent network of people to raise money from, or at least a couple million dollars. Um, you could raise money for other people. So like people at the beginning, if they don't have a really big pipeline to raise equity for, um, they will allocate a certain portion of the GP pool to capital raising. And so it would be based on however much you raise. Let's say it's a $10 million equity raise in total and you raise a million dollars. That's a 10% position of whatever was allocated towards um, the GP or the capital raise under the GP pool. The easiest way is just to do a JV. It depends on your deal. It depends on the, the, the business plan and how you plan on entering the multifamily business. You could do the smaller deals in your backyard. You could do smaller deals in somebody else's backyard. Um, one to $3 million transactions that are JV'd with one to two different people. That's my preference. That's the highest probability as far as I, I like. I make a lot of decisions based on data. Um, I've taken a lot of data. I've looked at a lot of deals. I've looked at a lot of people trying to get into the business and different entry points. The 16 to 32 unit deal in your backyard is the most probable uh, entry point for multifamily investing. When you when you say that, Gabe, you're talking about essentially the lowest barrier to entry? Or... Lowest barrier to entry. Yeah, lowest barrier to entry. Um, lowest barrier to entry that, because what, the reason I say this is I see a lot of people try to skip doing larger deal or doing smaller deals and uh, capital raise. And you'll end up raising a couple hundred grand for a $70 million deal or a $50 million deal. And that's if you find it, if everything goes through, like that's, that's assuming a lot of things. I see a lot of people put 12 months into it and they try to find deals and then try to like find the operator. They find the operator to sign on it. And then they raise 250 grand. If they do the deal, they close. Um, they don't really own a lot, like from an actual, like a money collected standpoint. Uh, I'm really focused on financial freedom, not the title that comes with being a GP on a $70 million transaction. I'm worried about what hits the account because that's how I make decisions, really what determines financial freedom. So for the deals that I've seen go from start to finish, for people that are entering the business brand new, um, they don't really retain a lot of the GP carried interest and they don't have any control. And you're giving up you're giving up control of your investor capital to an operator that you just met. And you have no idea if the deal is a good deal. I see a lot of people fail in it. And that's why I don't want people to fail. Like I have so many people that have joined 25 and 30 and $40,000 programs that don't know anything. They don't know how to underwrite. They don't know like anything. They've never talked to a broker, um, but they've been a 1% GP pool you know, investor. And they think that they're super, 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 super smart. I see the people that like the Scott Nowbacks, the, the guys that are doing eight unit deals and in for 45 grand and then flipping out of it and walking away with 300 grand a year later. I'm like, all right, well, that's a $300,000 or $300, score in 12 months. Uh, who here put yes in the chat if your life might be impacted in a forward direction if 300 grand in 12 month period would make a for or would make an impact in your life? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, me too. And so that's why like, I look at a lot of the you know, educators out there and a lot of the different pathways that people can take you down. Um, ours is much, I wouldn't say slower. It probably is slower. It's not as sexy. It's not as appealing, but it's the most probable. And if you want to play this game for a long period of time, uh, most just look at the look at every single real estate investor that's been in the business for 25 years. And look at their graphs. Look at where they started. When I say look at their graphs, I mean the units that they owned from like year one. Sometimes it's like zero. They might have not bought a deal in year one. They might have not bought a deal in year two. Sometimes it's for three years. Like, who knows? It doesn't, guess, doesn't really matter. Every, every celebrity guest we've had on here, it took them at least 12 months to do their first deal. Yeah. And so hundreds of millions of AUM. Yeah. At least 12 months for their first deal. So their graphs all look like this. Very, very, very slow. They buy their first one. And then it takes them another year, buys their second one, and then another one, and then a third. And then next thing you know, like at the back 70 to 80% of the graph, all you see is just enormous, like vertical, just can skyrocket. And you're like, right. that's a very, 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 very common graph to see when you're in real estate. 
It's just that graph for the very first five to like even five to 10 years is how I approach it. I'm like, it doesn't matter if it takes five to 10 years and you're in the low, in the low zone. I'm like, right. well, if I'm there and I know it's coming, well, let's just do it. So we're pretty much committed for as long as it takes. I mean, you're in a business. It, I don't have to be the person on the Zoom call that sells you on real estate. This is the number one wealth creation vehicle that there is that exists. Uh, just look around. That's right. That's right. And, and going back to partnerships really quick, I just the reason yeah. we spent a few minutes on that, just so yeah. everybody knows is, and Gabe mentioned this, you can't do multifamily real estate alone. You cannot do it. And there's yeah. different ways to team up and you're going to have to team up to do a deal for sure. And so you can do the JV way, you can do the fund to funds way, uh, raise capital and get some of the GP share, or you put together a GP team and you are going to comprehensively, you know, acquire and, and, and manage the deal. So, but, but at a fundamental level across all of those, it's so important to ask the hard questions, to be in alignment, have those core values and to make sure that there is <clears throat> Uh, not only complementary skill sets, I would say that's that's secondary or tertiary, but to be aligned on a core value level and for a long-term view. So that's a, that's a reason why we set a, a few minutes aside for you guys to understand partnerships. All right, let, let's do this here, Gabe. I, I'm curious on a couple of things here. Uh, I, I want, for those of you guys who want to engage Gabe directly, I want to give you all that opportunity. <clears throat> Please. Uh, so, Please. So raise your hand. Sure. It, it's pretty cool. I'll tell you what, man, to, to be able to have a, a conversation uh, with Gabe about, I mean, he can, he can speak. I'm just another guy, guys. I'm just another there. guy. I'm nobody special. It's just a lot of, it's compounding over a long period of time. That's what I realized. That's right. That's right, man. Um, so, so raise your hand. We can unmute you. Gabe, I'm going to fire away a question first here. Please. I, I think one thing, I mean, I struggle with this, but I think, yep. If I struggle with it, probably a lot of people struggle with it when it comes to capital raising. Yes. And just starting the conversation with somebody that maybe you've known a year, two, five, mm -hmm. ten. Just starting the conversation that could open up the door for them to be a potential investor in your deal. Yeah. What in the world does that look like? Yeah. I always like to show. And I don't like whenever I think about approaching um, a new investor, even if it's family, um, like my grandma, she, like she invests in bonds. I don't know if I'll ever get her to invest. She's just, she's like 70. I don't know how, she's the old person <laughs> that's very stubborn, 2% bonds. I mean, bonds today are very attractive to her at the fives. Um, you know, it's like, hey, just look what I'm doing. Like, I don't want to even, I'm not asking you for money. Like, let's just get that out of the way. Like, I know, you know me, I just got into this business. I want to let you know, I am jumping into this. I am making the commitment. But now here's the thing. If you're not there, if you're not certain that you are making the commitment and jumping into this business, get there before you start putting, because and whenever you raise capital, you step into a world where reputation is every single ounce. It does not matter about anything about the deal. You can build, right. it, it takes, uh, there's the, the saying, you can build a reputation for 25 years and it can be gone in 30 seconds. Reputation is everything in this industry. And so whenever you start having these conversations, like make sure you're committed for it for a long period of time. You don't want to tell people you're going to be raising money and then you don't raise money. It's like kind of, it just looks like almost like a bad look um, or it didn't work out and it looks like a negative. I don't like the negatives. Um, I would like, here, just, Hey grandma, look at what I'm, uh, look at what I'm working on. I wanted to let you know, I'm not working on the marinas anymore. Um, I moved over to the apartment buildings. And uh, I'm going to be raising money for, you know, four deals at some point. Um, now, obviously, I have a lot, you know, a lot of time or a lot to learn. I joined a community. I'm getting trained by professionals. You have to see it. it's insane, the people that I'm meeting. Um, and like, I'm I'm almost selling them on why I'm going to be very, 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 very trained. Um, now, if you don't have training, it's going to be really, really hard to come off. Like, you're going to be really trained if you don't have training and people are doing it. But if you have people, right. if you're on these calls... You're in a network with people and you're training, you're putting reps in, you're looking at deals, underwriting them, submitting offers. Um, that's how I would approach it. It's not like, hey, grandma, you know, I know you've known me for 10 years and you probably know me as like the kid that was riding a scooter down the street. Now I need 150 grand. Um, that's a weird conversation. Like to go from that to, hey, I need 150 without 
hey, I wanted to let you know about this big life change that I'm making. I've made the commitment to taking the next year to just diving as far at as far as needed and as deep as possible in the multifamily real estate. Um, at some point, I'm going to be raising money for these deals and maybe not even start there. Just be like, this is crazy. This is how the business works. You have a syndicator, you have an operator who finds the deal, and then you do what's this thing. Like you can educate them. You do what's called a value add. You go in, you prove the rent of it, or you improve the property, you renovate it, you increase the rents, and then NOI divided by cap rate. Like you can get them really excited. Like show them instead of, hey, I need 150 grand. I know that I just, you know, you paid for my college 10 years <laughs> or five years ago. Yeah, um, yeah. That's how I would go about it. Love it, brother. Love it. We got Nathaniel. Mr. Nathaniel here. Let's get you unmuted and you can fire your question away. All right. I guess, uh, first of all, I appreciate, you know, you being on here and talking tonight. A um, little back on me, prior Marine Corps, I got out a little bit early, started working in a factory. I was doing like 80 hours a week, industrial maintenance and uh, located in the Midwest in Iowa. So nice. we're just talking about Missouri kind of surprised me. You know, a lot of people are trying to invest, you know, Texas, Florida, Arizona, stuff like that. It gets slept uh, on. I'm telling yeah. you right now, it gets slept on. There's some great deals out there. Yeah, I've really been just trying to network with people, man, to be honest. And uh, I don't know, I kind of, I just want to take this time to kind of, I don't know, chat for a second, I guess. And um, how old are you? 20. Good, man. Yeah, I'm currently hey, in grants be, and program at the moment. So good. Be okay if nothing happens over the next five years. You yeah. can fail for five years and you're going to be completely okay. I know it won't happen. A lot, I talk to a lot of 19, 20, like I have a lot of, we have a, we have a diverse a group of people. We have people that are 40, 50, 60, and then they bring their sons in. And so we have a lot of conversations with younger 19, 20, 21, 22. It's completely okay. Mm. No, that's Five awesome. Years, 10 years. I kind of got to, so a question I have, you know, like I've really been uh, putting in a lot of hours, you know, really trying to study this, trying to underwrite deals, you know, looking at markets and stuff. And uh, I know for me, a big thing is trying to to build a team, you know, that you trust, but also that you know, you can get everybody on the same page and the same knowledge and have that same viewpoint. You know, what are some recommendations you have, I guess, with that? Um, are, you, are you clear on what you want and what you're going I, after right I would now? Say I'm clear, yeah. Yeah. What's your, what's your buy box? What size deals? Where at? What types of returns over what period of time? I'm looking at the cliche. Uh, I would say, you know, 32 unit apartment complex. Um, and cap rate, you know, probably around, I don't know, 6%, probably somewhere around there. Um, not, you know, just, just really trying to get the foot in the door, but do it the right way and do it the proper yeah. way. You know, I, I like to, I, I go off of logic, obviously in something like this, you hundred percent go off of logic um, mm -hmm. and making sure everything's right. You, you do your homework, you line everything up and, yeah. you know, really just trying to, so like here, let here, let me ask you a question. Let's say I give you a perfect home run deal, 32 units in your backyard. Perfect. Hmm. Uh, it's $3 million. How do you do like, do you have one? Do you have the absolute certainty? And I already know the question or I know the answer. Do you have the absolute certainty that on your underwriting, if, if, if it comes time to pull the trigger and ask investors for money, and say like it's three million dollars and you have to raise 500 grand from investors do you have the confidence in yourself right now in your numbers and your ability to execute the business plan that it takes to hit 15 or 20 percent returns to the investors over a you know three or five year period whatever it is um do you have the confidence to ask them with a straight face and say i need 500 grand i would say yes Good. I really actually honestly would. I mean, then you're, then you're clear on what you want. Now yeah. it's just how many investors have you talked to over the last 90 days and shown a deal and said, this is the last deal that I've submitted on. These are what the returns, these are what the returns would have looked like if we did get it. And this is how it works. How many conversations are you having like that? I would say maybe four to five. It was not, it's, it hasn't been a whole lot. That's been my big key thing is trying to, yeah, trying to network. Well, people. that's the easy part. Just yeah. add a zero behind every per, yeah. like five, do 40 to 50. Mm. Because those deals aren't going to require more than 500 to a million dollars, especially in the Midwest deals. 32 units is like a million dollars there. Right. It's, it's one to two investors away. Don't, don't get lost trying to build a, a database full of 500 people and don't, 
like the the surface level hey nice to meet you what do you do oh i invest in multifamily cool let's do a deal those conversations go nowhere just so you know and they don't remember you after you've left the event you're just you're somebody that they shook their hand they don't know who you are get like get out of the surface level and get into the details hey what are you looking for what types of returns show me the last deal that you did that's I say that a lot with anybody that's an operator that asks me for for money to raise money for their deal. I I don't ask them what's your buy box, what's your like, what are you looking for? Show me the last thing that you did. And so for you, I'd say show me the last LOI that you submitted and show me the deal that you submitted it on, and what types of returns would that deal have? Yeah, are you actually asking me personally right now? No, but okay. I can tell whenever I asked your your buy box, you're not a hundred percent clear. Get very certain. You should have a, a 32 units for $3 million that has 500 grand of equity. And you want to uh, you want to move NOI by 50% within the next 24 to 36 months. And you should be able to sell it for four to four and a half million. If you sell it for a seven cap and you pay off the loan, it should be this and net proceeds. And it should be these returns. Like you should be that crystal clear on your numbers. Right. Exactly. Precise. No, that's a hundred percent. Yeah. And I know I, and I, we don't have too many people on here. I will say like, be like good for going through grants, surface level stuff, dive into the details. Like, please. yeah, I know. He, he, I know for sure that he, you know, he tries to give you, like you said, the surface level and there's, there's a lot more to Just it. know there's a whole room of six other analysts that have 72 page underwriting models that take care of a lot of the stuff. The, the people, details matter. With people first getting in, like you had mentioned, um, you know, you're in the game for, you know, trying to actually benefit from this, you know, trying to get away from the nine to five and trying to get a passive yep. income that even if you have really low expenses, you know, in the Midwest, you can live cheap. Yeah. It's not like other places. So it doesn't take a whole lot to, you know, necessarily set you free depending on your, where you're at. Um, yes. You know, with getting in the first deal, you're talking about having partners and investors and stuff. And mm -hmm. you really, at the end of the day, are only getting, you know, getting that small smidge. Um, obviously you have ownership and, and a hard asset and sure, that, sure, you know, sure, sure. what, what's kind of your, your standpoint on that? You know, is it something with, if you're yeah. really good at initial first thing, actually, I, try to build up, I would, build up. I would get clear on what, what amount of money you need reoccurring or what amount of money you need in an annualized basis to replace and, or like figure out what that number looks like for you. If it's 50 grand a year, if it's a hundred grand a year, if it's 200 grand a year, whatever that number is, that's the, okay, 10 grand a month. Perfect. I need to make 120 grand in a year. What can I do to make 120 grand a year? Well, I can go find a $50 million transaction. I can take it to an operator that's going to have an 80-20 split. And then of the 80-20, I'm going to get like 0.2. And then the acquisition fee is going to be this. And so I would only get like 20 grand. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, what else can we do? I find a lot of success in the small deals. Like I have no problem with people. I call them adult flips. Like that's honestly what they are. Adult flips of, uh, <laughs> I keep referring to it. Scott's deal, an eight unit deal in the middle of nowhere in Ohio, gets in for 45 grand down, sells it a year later for $292,000. I love that. Like that's a score. That's 250 of net, a net score. I'm like, hmm, wow, 250 grand. Does that satisfy the amount of money that I need to make to leave my job? If so, then do it more. If not, then probably re, you know, re revisit the topic. So I like that. I am concerned. I focus on money in the bank and probability. What's the probability of you being able to pull off a $30 million transaction for your first one, never doing anything, never having like, like anything? Very, 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 very low. Is it a possibility? For sure, 100%. You see it. A lot of the marketing that you see is because of it. What's the probability of it? That's where things start to change. And so where the prop, where the most probable stuff is, is it's kind of, it's not the sexiest stuff in the world, but going back to look at the people that have interviewed here that have been in the business for 20 or 25 or 30 years, where they start. I started with some rinky dink eight unit deal in my backyard. I picked up a hundred grand on it and I did it and I got the certainty. I talked to the tenants. I called the plumber. I called like you grow so much and you develop the skill set that it actually takes to be the GP. No, a hundred percent. That's awesome. You it. That hundred grand yeah. definitely gets you to that, to that next, next uh, footstep too. That's for sure. Yeah, good, dude. You're like one fourplex away now. You're literally one fourplex away. Just do that. Like, 
understanding how to underwrite deals is so incredibly important because it it's the skill like I'm buying income and I can do something to it to increase the income and I can sell it for X. That's it. That's really you're buying income, you move income, you sell it for X. If you can understand that and apply it to the eight units, the 12s, the 14s, the 36s, I think that's a fantastic way to get into the business. And um, I look at the first the first three to five years um, of this business, I look at it as the infancy stage for a 20 to 30 year cycle. Most people want to change their entire life and be on a beach in the, like the first 12 months. So maybe changing the perspective and the runway that you're allowing for yourself. Who can like, I'll leave you guys with this. If I guaranteed you that a $10 million check would be in your account in 10 years from now on day 366, 10 years from now, would you figure it out for the next nine years, 364 days? But who here would? 10 million guaranteed. $10 million in 10 years from now, guaranteed, but you just have to figure it out for the next nine years and 364 days. Who here would take that bet? Every day, bro. This is the surest bet you can take. And it probably won't take 10 years. It takes probably it, The real timeline is closer to five. The deals that you buy in the first 12 to third, uh, I'd say the 12 to 18 month period, You'll get in, you'll get out, and you'll sell them between months 24 and 36. And once you sell or you do the cash out refi, that's where things start to just compound from there. Love it. Love it. Nathaniel, thanks so much, man. Uh, we got time. All right. We got, I got time. I got time. Let's do, let's do them. Let's do them quick. If you don't Two questions. Mind, we got to do, we yeah. got to keep it quick. Let's keep it concise and tight. All right. Yeah, let's roll. Let's go. Um, Kevin, you're first here on my screen. So let's get you unmuted here, bro. Good to see you. Uh -oh. oh, we can't hear you, bro. We can't uh -oh, hear you, Kevin. Kevin. You're, you look you're good, though. You, you are unmuted, but audio is not I, coming through. I need to see what you're doing with that beard, how you keep that in line. Kevin, let us come back to you, bro, because we oh still my. can't hear you. That's all good. We'll come back to you, Kevin. So, Linda, let's get you on here, okay? Let's get you unmuted. Beard butter, he says. Yeah, see, I'm learning about all this stuff. Hey, Gabe. Um, my question is kind of open-ended. Uh, I wanted to know if you could tell us more about the um, the deal room. Yeah. Is yeah, come and check it out. We do test trials. So I really, so coming from Grant's office, you would expect that I'm some high-pressured sales guy that loves the pitch stuff. Um, I am actually the exact opposite. We do completely free test trials for our community. Um, we meet every single week, twice a week on Tuesdays and uh, Wednesdays, every week at 7.30 Eastern. Um, there's two components. It's an education component. So we have a pretty, pretty interactive 90-day onboarding process. Um, the first 30 days, you go through 15 hours of tutorials on the advanced underwriting. And then you meet with our underwriting team. We have two underwriters. Days 30 through 60, you're working on presenting a deal to our Wednesday call. So it's you underwriting and pretty much implementing the education. It's really important for me to actually do stuff instead of just learn. And then the last 30 days is you submitting an offer. That's how we track education and why we know that we're worth it. Um, if you can develop the transferable skill set and um, actually use it, which is the implementation, it's submitting an offer. That's how we know it's good. Um, and then people. So education is really, 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 really important and cool, but it's useless until it's used. And so you have to be focused on loading a pipeline of deals and having the people to support it. So we interview every single person that joins. Um, I target people that have been in real estate for a couple of years. They flip a home, higher net worth individuals, people that are accredited, um, people that have really good heads on their shoulders uh, that are sourcing deals. We have 180 people total. The average net worth is over a million bucks. We're under contract on 518 units. Um, and we submitted on over half a billion dollars of deals this year in 2023. So that's what the deal room is. Next step for everybody here, you can't join right this second. Come and see, like for like for real, you can't join. Come into our test trial. I want you to see. Managing expectations is extremely important for us. Um, our game is a renewal game. So we want you for life to do that. We have to manage expectations really well on the front end. Outstanding. And, and the deal room link. So that is right there, dealroom.io. Yeah. And it just dropped all Gabe's links in the chat. 
Yeah, go to the go to the website, um, schedule a call. We have a team of seven now. We've grown. So last time we did this, it was just me and my wife and like one part-time sales guy. We have a team of seven now. Um, we're going in office next year. We're doing our first in-person event next year, Q1. Um, and when you guys see the deal that we got, it's um, I think 2024 should be like a catalyst, should be one of those catalyst years. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah. All right. All let's right. finish with Kevin. Selena, thank you so much. Hey. Kevin, I think we can hear Kevin. you now. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Outstanding. Good to see you, Trevor. Gabe, nice to meet you, man. My name's Kevin. I'm out of New York. Yeah. And I'm I'm a lawyer in New York. I'm also licensed in Florida. Very and cool. Yeah. So I've done real estate transactional work small scale stuff yeah. and i started out like got into the single family game done a bunch of rehabs did a new build yeah. but what i'm seeing for myself is like i never really plugged in with the big dogs like how you got in with grant yeah, 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 and yeah. i see that i if i'm in the bigger arena i could excel because i, I bring a lot of skill sets to the table yeah but i'm just like thinking what about you... how to break in so would yeah. you say that objective would be to pair up with someone like that like try to get linked up somehow and offer yeah value. well what do you what do you want to do what's the what's the core question there what is your intention is your so you're practicing law right now that's your main that's your main gig you're producing a lot of income good for you um i would imagine do you invest as an lp right now or over all of it's active controlled by you right now i've just done like my own single family stuff like yeah trying to yeah. snowball it but that so, was before i had the bigger vision of what's possible with this these yeah. type of assets you know yeah when you look at the next five years does it look like you continuing to practice law or does it look like a transition period of moving all the way jumping into multifamily, syndicating opening fund and kind of building out the machine that you see as possible yes the yeah. latter yeah yeah so you need to find people that are two to five years ahead of you and not mm -hmm. five to 25 years ahead of you and mm -hmm. link in with them that are also doing deals that obviously you have net worth, you have liquidity, you have clients, you have investors, you bring a lot of value to the table. And then your rehab mm -hmm. experience, you do bring value, mm -hmm. um, figure out how you can solve another person's problem. So like Ken, for instance, this deal, um, like the Daytona deal, it makes a lot more sense there. The Daytona deal, Ken has a fund, it's already raised and he's invest his job is to invest capital. And so if he doesn't have deals, he can't invest capital. And if it sits there, it's no good. Mm -hmm. him, he didn't need me to do the deal at all. Like he could have easily done it by himself. I found the deal. I solved one of his biggest problems by bringing him the deal that he can then invest into. And it's 55 units. It's not 255 units. So it's much smaller than he would like. Hey, mm -hmm. Ken. I'll raise a million bucks for it. I found it for you and I'll take care of all the, all the headaches that go through the regional manager now can go through me instead of going through regional manager directly to you. So I'll remove, I'll remove the headaches. I found the deal so you can invest the money. You can get, I mean, he owns 75% of the carried interest. I'm a 25% of the owner. Uh, we'll make a decent amount of money on it. He gets to kind of sit, you know, relative backseat GP driver there on a smaller deal and make a significant chunk of capital and everybody wins. And then obviously he, he likes me, he wants to help me out, wants to mm -hmm. get me going. Um, that helped, but it certainly wouldn't have been like, hey, Ken, here's an OM, let me know if it's a good deal. I did all, I did a lot of the hard work and I fit in. Um, you're a really good fit for the deal room. So come to the test cool. drive, I'd love to Yeah, you. yeah, I bet. We have, just so you know, we have, a lot of, we have a lot of people just like you, like you're a perfect cool, person. Awesome. Hey, are you in the Tampa area also? Is that where I live in Tampa? Run? Yeah. Oh, yeah, cool. I live in Tampa. Nice. I have a place in uh, Port Ritchie, a little little bit north. Beautiful. We'll meet yeah. we'll meet in person. And you'll come All down right. you have to come down to the in-person event. Yeah, that'd be cool. I'll be around town next week. So if, cool. if you're well, free, um, remember. Yeah, come I'll right. I will get your number. I'll reach out to you. We'll connect All offline. Right. Cool, man. Good to meet cool. you, Gabe. Awesome. Yeah. Good to meet you, man. All Thanks right. for being Take with care. us tonight, bro. Good to yeah. see you, man. Thanks, Trevor. See you soon. All right, Gabe, I would say let's wrap up here. Y'all know how we like to finish. Grab your cell phone. We got to show Gabe some love. He spent an extra 15 minutes with us tonight. Let's do this. Thing. Fast, Gabe. Sunday. I appreciate you guys staying on. I'm not, 
I don't know if I'm worth your Sunday at 10 p.m. I'm going to be honest with you. But thank you for being on, guys. I really do appreciate it. Well, they, they thought it was worth it, brother. So and, yeah. and that's the main thing. Grab your cell phones, guys. Let's take a picture here really quick. And let's um let's light up social media and show some love to Gabe. His handle yeah. on Instagram is at multifamily, which is unbelievable. We didn't even get into yeah. that tonight, Gabe. I sold Instagrams, cool. just so you got to know. I sold Instagrams back in my day. I was 16 <laughs> and 17, that's so right. I was making some money. That's right, man. Let me let me get this pick here. One, two, three. Mm, thank you, awesome, guys. Awesome, man. Awesome. Good stuff, Gabe. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. This was such a fitting ending to the activation zoom for 2023. It was great having you on. Thank you. Anybody here, please reach out to us and just mention that you came from uh, from this call. We will we will take uh, extra good care of you. Just reach out. We're more than happy to to help anybody here. Thank you, bro. Thank you.